because there's definitely some material for questions in here, I'll tell you that. Let's see here. Um, let me share my little slide thing here with you. All right. Hopefully you all read this chapter already. Either way, let's talk about it. So they give you a definition of clinical massage here. Um, I underlined it because I think there's a test on it tonight. Um, I don't, I've never once heard somebody walk around using this definition. Um, but the idea of clinical massage is that we are really creating a treatment plan and trying to get somebody better. I, by the way, feel like all of your massages should have some kind of plan in your head at least, right? Even if your massage is just a general relaxation massage, I mean, there's not even such a thing in a way. I've always got some plan of action. Ms. Green, please. Sorry, that was an accident. <laughs> okay, good. Keep going. You're just testing me. I'm on my toes. Um, so uh, your plan might, might be a therapeutic one of actually making somebody better. It might be a palliative, palliative plan. Who can tell me what palliative care is? Ms. Hendrickson? Um, it's it's care that it's not trying to cure anything, but just make them feel better. Yeah. Um, and we do it in massage more, more often than you might think. So we've discussed this in here. I'm always trying to operate off some plan to make somebody feel better, but uh, in the long run, but, but some things uh, can't be changed or shouldn't be changed at that time, right? Um, if you're pregnant, it's not my time to work on increasing your flexibility and trying to fix some postural thing. I don't even know what your actual posture is. Um, it's time to provide palliative care. So we always think of palliative care as end-of-life care, but it's not always end-of-life care. Um, it is also care with somebody where, where their body is not in a place where um, we can create that kind of change and we're just trying to provide relief. From them and massage is fantastic at that um, it might be somebody with chronic pain and massage just helps them manage the pain and and massage is never going to get rid of their, their pain problem because it's beyond the capabilities of massage yes miss korea uh like how i explained my friend had scoliosis that was in result of one of the legs being shorter than the other that's beyond my my care yeah it would just be relieving his, um, his discomfort symptoms, yeah because yeah. You, there is no massage technique that grows bone and lengthens that leg right that is a surgical fix um if they even want to do it and sometimes it's not even a good idea to do it and so the best we're ever going to do is get very clever at finding all the muscles that are bothering this person and massaging them um and we're, we're going to talk about this in a, in a minute there's some stuff that you don't want to fix believe it or not because it's an adaptive thing the person has done um, and we essentially sometimes don't want to change adaptive things that somebody has done. Um, we even do this emotionally, by the way. You know, if a, if a kid has a, a, a security blanket, um, maybe they need to be slowly weaned off that. I'm not even sure about that, by the way. <laughs> but, but I wouldn't rip it away from them, right? It's an adaptive thing that helps them manage situations. So I'm not going to rip it away. And people do that physically, too. They have adaptive things that help them manage other problems. And... It's not necessarily my job to go in there and change things that are working for them, basically. We'll get into that a little bit later in this chapter here. Uh, so physical rehabilitation, though, is um, trying to get somebody back, back, back to where they were before something happened. And massage therapists work with physical therapists a lot. Our, our two things go together so, so well. Um, I was talking to a guy... Uh, who was actually vice president of another community college. And he said at that college, strangely enough, I was talking about my students going on to do physical therapy, which some of our students do, by the way. There's a really good physical therapy assisting program here. Um, and Miss Borish, that's what she's doing right now. She's becoming a physical therapy assistant. Um, so massage and physical therapy go very well together because it, in a way, massage lengthens muscles and opens up tissue and physical therapy uh, strengthens tissue, and those two things go very well together. Um, but he was telling me, this vice president was telling me that at his college, physical therapy students afterwards go to take massage therapy. And I was like, why? 
Um, and he said, well, for two reasons. He said, one is they don't really get enough massage therapy in the physical therapy course, and they actually recognize it's really valuable. Um, and the other thing is a physical therapy assistant student, physical therapy assistants make pretty good money, by the way, everybody. Um, so much so that some people don't decide to become physical therapists. They just stay physical therapy assistants, uh, PTA students. Anyway, but they have physical therapy assistant students or, or graduates have to work under a physical therapist. They have to. They can't touch somebody without that person being around. Massage therapists can touch somebody without being supervised. And so if you're a, phys if you're a PTA, you become a massage therapist and it allows you to all of a sudden do all sorts of stuff. So it's just a clever workaround around a licensing thing. Yes, Ms. Avalos. Um, yeah, when we were at the hug clinic, we got to meet the PTA students and a lot of them really wanted us to show them what we were doing and why, because they said they didn't really get to learn all of that. So it was kind of like a tit for tat type of scenario. They're like, hey, did you know about this? And it's like, oh, okay, hey, try this out. So it was, it was really neat to work with the PTA students when we were there. Very yeah. good. Very but cool. they really did want to know, what do you know and why are you doing that? Yeah. 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 So it was kind of neat. Yeah, I love that. Very cool. Miss, uh, Miss Korea. Yeah, I was going to say as well, uh, they also saw the results from massage therapy because uh, I'm actually had 10 minutes with their, with their patients and they saw improvement in their patients just with 10 minutes of us just either gently working because usually these are people in pain so they can't handle the rigorous movements so we would we it was just enough to loosen them and they saw just even the slightest improvements that probably took them a while to it like maybe even weeks or months to even get them to that point so that. it was really cool yeah it's nice to have other tools in your tool belt every profession massage therapists included, including Mr. Tapscott, falls prey to this thing where you start to think your techniques can solve everything, right? And massage is not a replacement for surgery. Massage is not a replacement for physical therapy. Massage is just one thing, right? And physical therapy is not a replacement for that. So what happens is people go to school and they're like, oh, physical therapy is amazing. It does all these things. It does, but there's a lot of things it doesn't do. And so it's kind of neat when you learn multiple disciplines or learn to work with people with multiple disciplines and some of you may even choose to actually work in a rehab center and rehab centers are kind of like the hug clinic um, that some of you experienced where you are working with people from multiple professions all trying to work on a client problem together it's, it's amazing because then you're using lots of different tools for that kind of stuff okay um, insurance companies paying for a massage yes it does happen it's trickier than you might realize um, it's tricky in this um, country, especially. In some other countries, it's not as tricky. And usually when insurance pays for massage, usually you're working in a rehab center under a doctor's supervision, and the doctor is billing your workout as, as, as rehab work. That's really how it usually happens. Um, I have talked to some therapists who claim, I've never done it, by the way. I've talked to some therapists who claim that they've been able to do it under some circumstances, but they say the amount of paperwork is really difficult and dealing with insurance companies is really difficult, really difficult. Uh, they want you to have an awful lot of documentation and be able to prove stuff and they're very late in pain. Um, some other things that you might come across too is um, accident patients. So I had um, a friend who kind of worked in a rehab kind of center and they worked with accident patients that referred to them by the lawyer that was working with them and things like that. Um, and they didn't get paid until there was a settlement on the case. So my friend was often getting paid for a massage uh, that they did six months ago. And they said, though, that it was worth it <laughs> because they got paid at a ridiculous rate. You know, and they got to keep that like $80 an hour. And so they said once they worked there about six months, then they were always kind of getting paid from something in the past. Um, but you'll see that sometimes too. Uh, let's talk about pain. So pain, we've talked about it before. We've talked about it when we talk about the nervous system. It's supposed to be informing you that you have tissue damage of some kind, that something's actually going to go on and there's damage um, in your body. But as we have found out, that is not always the case. It could be that the wires that deliver pain are what are being damaged. 
Um, you guys should all remember that from the nervous system, the nervous system is a series of wires that go everywhere, everywhere in your body, down to every little last little minuscule space in your body. And at the end of these wires are different receptors on each wire, like different switches that get flipped on each wire. Some sense vibration, some sense pressure, some sense deep pressure, some sense heat, some sense cold, all sorts of stuff. But no C-ceptors, no C-ceptors are often referred to as your pain receptors. Um, and what they're really known for, no C-ceptors are supposed to be picking up the chemicals that come off of damaged nerve, of damaged tissue. So again, no C-ceptors don't really receive pain, um, although they are how we perceive it. What they're really sensing is possible damage in tissue, and they're sending you a signal. Now, if a no C-ceptor wire gets pinched, it will often send a signal to your head, and you will think that there is damage going on somewhere that you are. You will feel pain as though something is being damaged in another area of your body, but it's it's wrong. But anyway, no C-ceptors are your pain receptors, and they're really sensing for damaged tissue. They're just not always accurate. It's not a perfect system. Um, there is a theory of, of how pain is perceived in the body, and it's called the specific theory of pain. And let me put it to you very, very simply. It's the concept that there is a wire, which I just told you, it's not even the concept, it's a fact. There's a wire going to each pain receptor. And so in theory, and this is true actually, I shouldn't say in theory, it's true. Um, what happens is that if you feel pain, a nociceptor is being set off, like this person's toe is actually feeling the nociceptor being set off. It's going up that wire, up to their head, and the head says, oh, that is a nociceptor attached to my big toe or little toe. And it is, it's telling me that there's damage occurring. I'm going to alert this person by making them feel pain. All this is made up in your head, by the way. All your head got was dee 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 dee. That's it. But your brain goes dee 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 dee. From that wire means I'm being damaged on my big toe. I'm going to send that thing to this. I get this person's attention. Pain is meant to get your attention. So specific pain theory says that's specific to that nerve wire. And the reason things hurt more or less is because more or less nociceptors get set off. Remember, you've got nociceptors every little teeny tiny little less than a millimeter over all over your body. So if I set off a hundred nociceptors because the whole tip of my finger gets cut off, I've got a hundred wires. They're very tiny wires, remember? hundred wires going to my brain going, dee 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 And my brain's like, holy crap. That's 100 nociceptors. So your, your perception of pain is, is due to this specific uh, theory of pain that you're getting, you're getting specific pain receptors set off, and as you get more and more set off, you tend to feel more and more pain. Um, of course, of course, other things um, can affect your perception of pain. Uh, that you can actually have, um, you can actually have the nerve pinched. Really simply put, you can have the nerve pinched all along that path. So you can have a nerve pinched in your back, and it hurts down your leg, right? And again, this is a very fancy way of your your book telling you that pain is actually a perceived phenomenon. I know it doesn't do you any good when you hit your thumb with a hammer, but in a real way, we don't experience pain. What really happens is those electrical signals go to our brain, and that's our brain's way of getting our attention. And as we all know, as we all get lost in when we're doing our art or watching TV or whatever we're doing, sometimes it takes a lot to get our attention. And pain has been set up to make sure it gets your attention when your brain thinks something's going on but it really is something your brain is telling you. I thought you said something there, Miss Avalos. That's why I paused. But I think you were just talking to someone. Okay. <laughs> She's so cute. There we go. All right. Um, and this is why we perceive pain differently depending on what emotional state we're in. You know, when you guys are getting some new ink on your body or a new piercing, 
that's really painful stuff. But for some of you, it's almost pleasurable because you enjoy the product of what's happening. So your attitude about it is amazing, right? And that has a lot to do with how your, your brain then perceives those signals. Hurts so good. Yeah. Come on, baby. Make it hurt so good. Yeah. Um, and so that's the neuromatrix theory of pain. It's just that, that you get some say in the pain you experience. Have you guys ever noticed that sometimes your anticipation of pain is worse than the pain itself? Like when you're going to get a shot, you know, it's, it's much, I mean, I get all worked up. The shot's not so bad, but my anticipation of it's what, what really is, is the, the big part. Um, Neuroplasticity. So inside your brain, you have a whole bunch of neurons that are very much like the wires in your body. Um, and you have what's called neuroplasticity. So nerves that fire together, wire together. You might have heard this expression before. And that literally means that if I think a thought over and over again, my neurons tend to grow closer to one another with that thought. It's how memories are formed. If, if, if every time, if every time I do gratitude, I drink a cup of coffee, I tend to associate coffee with gratitude and vice versa. That's just normal. Um, and it's the reason we do gratitude every day, by the way. We don't, we don't do gratitude for just arbitrary reasons. We do it because you actually start to fire your neurons and they link together to look for things to be grateful for instead of to look for things to be weary of or upset about. I'm sure you all have a super uh, atomic habits. Yep. Well, actually, I'm, my girlfriend and I are listening to that right now. Um, I, I'm sure you all have a friend that you like, a good person, but who's really negative, you know? And you're like, you just won the lottery. And they're like, yeah, but now everybody's going to want money from me. Like, they can find the negative in everything. That's not because they're a bad person. That is a learned behavior. They have learned that when something happens, something bad is going to happen. I'm going to look for it. And guess what? They're very good at finding it and making it happen. So we are actually using the neuroplasticity of your brain to train positive attitudes, which I think you have all found out attract positive attitudes. This class didn't happen by accident. It's because we are all capable of learning new habits and creating new environments inside our brain, which creates environments outside our brain. Anyway, I say all this, by the way, I'm sorry I'm on my soapbox, but I say all this because we need to do this for our clients too. So with my clients, don't ever lie to a client. And I don't just mean because it's unethical, but because the minute you lie to somebody, the minute I give one of you a compliment that's not due, you know that, and then you don't believe anything I'll tell you in the future. So I always make sure if I tell you something nice, it's the truth. Uh, but we can look for nice stuff to tell our clients. We can tell them things like, Hey, your shoulders are going to be kind of sore from what we did today, but it's going to be a different kind of soreness, and I think we loosen them up. They need you to help them change their thinking, their neuroplasticity, so they start telling themselves like, oh, yeah, they are kind of they are kind of better because they've been telling them, themselves this story the whole time. I've watched clients actually work themselves up as they're like, my shoulders are so tight, and I actually watch them lift them up and tighten them for me, and I'm like, ah, stop. So it's very important that you understand you can help your clients rewire their brain. Yeah. Neuroplasticity. Love it. Um, neuropathic pain. We already talked about this, but this is, this is pain that's caused usually by nerve entrapment or damage. It's not actually necessarily the nerve, the nociceptor being set off. I already said this. So... Uh, and it can happen anywhere. It can happen along the peripheral nerve or all by the time it gets to your spine, right? And any of you who've had back pain know about this because you'll be like, but my knees hurt or my feet hurt or my bladder hurts or whatever, and it's all because you got nerves pinched in your back. Those areas are fine, right? But they might as well be hurting because it starts to mess you up that way. And we deal with that a lot in massage, right? Um, yes, Mr. Dimitra. Um, I was massaging a friend yesterday who's got low back pain, and pretty much everywhere I pressed on her back, there was pain in another area. So if I'm pressing on the left side of her, you know, just the QL and everything, 
she's like, man, I'm feeling that over on the right side, you know, down in my hip. Or if I were getting into the deep six, she's like, ooh, now I feel that up in my back. And I was just like, all right, I don't know if I'm hitting nerves or I'm just going to stop because you shouldn't be getting referred pain. Well, yeah, I know, and I appreciate it because you've obviously listened to me where I said basically you shouldn't be doing that, but um, I would go back and work on her. Let me let me, let me me clarify. We throw out some, some general rules to you guys when you first start school, right? We're like, don't work, you know, the back of the knee. Oh, my God. But then later we're like, well, actually, you kind of can work the back of the knee. Just don't go deep and stay on the sides because that's where the muscles cross. And we start to layer more information on there, right? It's kind of like when you're a kid and we say, don't cross the street. But later, you have to cross the street all the time. You just need to be careful about it. So this is kind of like that, too. So, Ms. Dimitra, uh, when you are stretching somebody, especially their back, getting referred pain is usually a sign that you are probably pushing on a herniated disc and making that nerve pressure worse, and we don't do that. Other types of referred pain in general, when you are just massaging somebody and you're not twisting them and things like that, are probably okay. And probably your friend is hypersensitive because their back has been messed up so long um, that the nerves just fire off like that. Yeah, and this is the first time I worked on her, so it's just like, I'm like, when's the last time you had a massage? And she's like, it's been two or three years. Yeah. Now, you did, I mean, you just start on slow and work in. But yeah, I appreciate you being cautious, but you, you can work on them. Yeah. And hypersensitivity, right. everybody, of your nerves is exactly like hypersensitivity after a fight. Right? So, like, Miss Carrillo and I argue a lot, um, and, like, sometimes she'll apologize to me later, and I'm like, yeah, it's fine. But then she'll be like, hey, Tap's got, I got one more question. What? I'm hypersensitive. I'm already irritated from the thing, right? And nerves are exactly the same way. And the reason I did that with you guys just now is that's how I explain it to clients, too. Because clients will be like, well, it's, I'm like, hey, look, their nerves, they've been irritated for a long time. I think we've relaxed that, but they're still edgy. So the best thing you could do is go home, have a glass of wine. Yes, I do prescribe wine to my clients. Have a glass of wine, take a bath, take a nap. Like, that's the best thing you could do. So to kind of let them know, like, what's going on. Yes, Miss Creo. I meant, yes, Miss Creo. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, because um, I found out a friend of mine, uh, one of the ones I regularly see, I was noticing I can't put as much pressure on her and, her her pain tolerance isn't that high, but the the back she has a posterior tilt. I noticed, and so it must be irritated. And when I was working her back and her upper glutes, where she was feeling pain, she couldn't take a lot of pressure. And I was so I, I was like, I just need to go easier on you then. Yeah. But yeah, it could be the nerves, and yeah. it, it is the nerves all being yes. over reacting like a certain teacher I have. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, well said. Um, and one of the things I really look at is, am I making, not, I'm not so much worried about damaging somebody, because in general, that's harder to do than we think. Uh, but I am worried, am I causing them so much preferred pain that they're tightening up? Right? Am I undoing the very work I'm trying to do? Because um, I don't think you can beat somebody into submission. <laughs> as much as I try to massage that way. Yeah, I mean, so if they're tensing up from the work I'm doing, that's a problem. And that's kind of how I gauge a lot of it. So. Okay, really quickly, acute pain, you guys should know, is short-term pain. Your book says less than 30 days. I've heard all sorts of diff definitions, but acute pain means short-term pain. A lot of times we're not working on acute pain. Like if I bump my elbow and it's swollen and I come to you, that's going to go away in 30 days. It's acute pain, but it's also what kind of contraindication is it? My elbow's swollen. I ran into a door. Anybody? Yes, Mr. Overman, please. Local. Local contraindication. Can I still do the massage on that person? Yeah, you just got to avoid that area. Thank you. Yeah, they've explained to me I hit my elbow into a wall. There's no reason. They're not running a fever or something like that. They haven't broken it as far as I know. Um, it's, it's fine. Exactly. It's a local contraindication. And so a lot of acute pain we don't work on. Um. Well, a lot of what we work on is chronic pain, right? Chronic pain is the long-lasting stuff. Your book says three months, but it's just long-lasting. And you'll have these clients all the time. They're like, you know, oh, is there anything I should avoid or anything, anything I should know about? I got a bad back. Oh, should I be careful of that? No. It's been bad for 15 years. You should stand on it. Okay. 
I mean, I hear that all the time, right? And those kind of clients are the best clients to work on too. I'll be like, how's it feel now? It really hurts, but it's a different hurt. Thank you. I'll see you next week. <laughs> so here's 20 extra bucks. I mean, they're so happy just to have you just dig in there. Um, yeah. Anyway, and those are the clients too. They're like, I'm like, are we doing a full body day? I don't care what you do. Just work on that back. If you spend the whole time in the back, I don't care. Anything. Back, back, back. If you got extra time, then do something else. But, you know, favorite kind of clients. That's chronic pain. You guys will see a lot of that. Um, obviously, everybody has pain tolerance levels. This is something I want you to think about. I have a theory. I have no proof of this theory. But, but my theory is that everybody likes therapeutic massage. My theory is that that feeling that you guys get when your muscles are worked, everybody likes that. Even the people that come in and they're like, oh, I just like to relax. Even people that like very light massage like that feeling. They just feel it at a much lower pressure level. But nobody really just wants, I shouldn't say nobody. There's somebody out there I know, and it's fine. If you're this person, it's fine. But nobody really wants to be tickled. They actually like feeling their tissue being worked. It's just some people don't require a lot of pressure to feel that, and other people do. And that's because they have different pain tolerances, different pain levels, different uh, how often they've been having massage makes a huge difference. I guarantee you if Miss Dimitra goes back and works on her friend again, it'll be dramatically better just because she's at least touched her now, right? And it will keep going up. So that's just my theory. I Even when people come to me and say, I just want a relaxing massage, I secretly try to do therapeutic work on them. I just do it very light. And what they're really telling me is I don't want to hurt during the massage. I got that. I get that. So I'm not going to hurt you, but I'm still going to try to fix stuff. You know, because they love it. They absolutely love it. And if you ask them, I've said this before, but if you ask them, and I've asked this question, I'm not kidding you, probably 300 times because I have people come in the resort when I used to work there. And they'd be like, oh, I just want to relax. And I go, do you just want to relax for this one hour, or are you telling me you want to feel relaxed for several days afterwards, which might require a little bit of discomfort during this hour? And they're like, oh, yeah, that's what I meant. Because people at a resort that just want to relax stay up in their, their room and have a glass of wine and stay in the top. They don't need to come down to the spa. Most people mean, I want you to take away the stress I have, and I want to feel relaxed later. They actually don't mean just relax me for that hour. Um, let's, oh, your book wants you to know about sensitization. Yes, Mr. Godot, please talk to me. Um, can you say that again? Like, I know you said, like, relax, like, most people, I, I know what you're saying, but the way you explained it is, like, perfect, I feel like, because I'll talk to people before I massage and I'll ask, like, are you looking for more relaxation or therapeutic? Yeah. But um, the way you explained it, I was trying to write it down, but cool. I kind of no, I, it. I know you said I love. Relax, it. I love that you like how I said it. I'm happy to say it twice. So a couple things. One is I don't ask them. I don't ask people what pressure they like before the massage. I think it's a very confusing question. I don't ask. Mm -hmm. I don't ask them if they've ever had massage before, because I think it doesn't really tell me a lot. It tends to put them in the spot where they're like, no, I, I haven't. Like whatever. Um, and I don't ask them if they want therapeutic or relaxation because okay. I, I don't, I think it's, I mean, I think all of us would agree we want both, don't we? I'd love both. I want, I want chocolate and cake and soda. Anyway, so, but what I do ask them, sir, is sometimes I'll, I'll be like, what are we working on today? And they're like, oh, nothing, just, just relaxation. And that's when I ask them this. I say, are you telling me you just want to be relaxed for this one hour, or do you want me to do some therapeutic work so that you feel relaxed for several days after? And every time they say, I want you to do some therapeutic work so I feel relaxed for several days after. All right. Sounds good. That's perfect. Thank yeah. you. And by the way, I admit to all of you that I'm sure one out of 100 people don't say that, but I'm not kidding you. I think 99% of people go, oh, yeah. I just don't want you to beat me up. But, yeah, you can do some therapeutic work. I, this neck's killing me and all sorts of stuff, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Um, referred pain. We were just talking about this. We said it's not. In fact, here it is. Ms. Dimitra, it's in writing. Uh, it's not good when you're experienced during stretching because, because we're worried that you're, you're compressing stuff in the spine and just making something worse. Um, but referred pain is a sign of what's called a trigger point. 
trigger points are usually where you press on one area, um, and quite often it's local, it's tender at the area you're pressing on, and they also feel pain at another area. Yeah. And trigger points are all the rage right now. Um, I, I have a huge problem with trigger points. It is a bias. And it is a Tapscott bias, and I am not the knower of all things massage at all. Uh, but my problem with trigger points is, for one thing, while somebody's holding my trigger point, they're affecting a very tiny area of my body. They're holding that. And by the way, the idea is you hold a trigger point until it starts to release and that referred pain goes away. And the idea is you're probably untrapping a nerve. And I don't think that's such a bad idea. But I would rather expand all the tissue around there. I think it's a waste of time. I think there's better things I could be doing with my time. That's my one complaint about trigger points. Um, my other complaint about trigger points is I think they become an excuse to be a lazy therapist. I've watched people kind of go around. You kind of wow the client, and they're like, oh, wow, I feel that there, and you hold the thing there. But are we really getting a lot of work done? I don't know. My third complaint about trigger points is people aren't a bag of buttons. And pushing on a button doesn't usually solve the whole problem. Now. Does that mean I ignore them completely? Absolutely not. But I tend to think of them as rubbing out that whole area and let's get it open and let's let's go. That's me. Um, and I am I am not the norm. I would say most massage therapists are like trigger point crazy. Mr. Uh, Mr. Richards, please. Isn't um, trigger points just reflexology but in narrow down? I guess you could look at it that way, but they, uh, the Western practitioners claim that it really is an area where there is a knot. Um, and there's no such thing as a knot, but there's an area where there's probably muscle fiber caught in a contraction that's also pinching on a nerve. We think that's what trigger points are. And I want to be very clear, because this is a fact. Most massage therapists are sure they know what trigger points are. They'll be like, oh, no, they're this thing. It actually hasn't been conclusively proven what they are even. Nobody's even quite sure. But we think it's probably muscle fiber that's caught in a contraction, and there's nerves that run through them, they're probably pinching on the nerve, and that's probably causing the thing to stay in a contraction. Uh, but in that case, too, I want to flush that area out to get new blood in there to uncontract the muscle gates and stuff and get it to unstick. So, so you, you'd use a larger area for that, wouldn't you? Not just one little point, you'd, you know, like the reflexology part. Yeah. In fact, yeah, I think it's, I think that's a, I, and, and the reason I guess I'm so anti-trigger points, I think that's kind of a freshman mistake, right? We, we, maybe you guys didn't do it, but I did. When I first got out of school and I found out you had a tight spot, I beat that spot. And yeah, I got it to loosen up, but I probably had sacrificed a lot of tissue around there, right? And I think it's much better to look more globally, to work out from spots. Like, yeah, go ahead and hit that trigger point, but let's work out and work out and work out and let's work chains and let's, yeah. Yeah, I just, I, just, I think it's a better approach. Um, so and, trigger points is just the point, that's it. They yeah, just push on the point, let go, done. Yeah, trigger point is the concept that there is a point, probably a muscle stuck in contraction. When you press on it, it is sore at the point, and it refers to another point. That's what technically makes it a trigger point. Whether we know what they are or not, it, it is painful here, and it refers to another spot. So we assume, like, oh, there's a trapped nerve there. That's kind of thought. Um, and, I mean, some people just are, love them. I just... You know, I think they're overrated. That's me. I'm sorry. By the way, if you guys love them, I'm not just saying this to take my foot back out of my mouth. If you love them, I'm sure there's a whole field that could be done on trigger points. So please don't don't feel like you shouldn't be doing them when I walk by you in lab. It, that's just, I just want to give you, I like to give you guys lots of different things to think about, if that makes sense. Um, but te technically, you press on a point, it's sore, and it hurts the client in another area. Then what you do is you don't put more pressure there. You hold it till it releases, and that referred pain starts to diminish. It doesn't usually go away, but it cuts in half, and then you move on. And there's nothing wrong with that, but then go back and rub the whole area. Ms. Carrillo, please. Yeah, I was um, I was someone that I accidentally worked, like, focused on trigger points. I didn't even know it was trigger points. It was just a knot, and then I just wanted to work the knot. But I was guilty of working just the knot, but because of clinic, uh, one of the patients was super hypersensitive, so I couldn't work the knot, but I worked the tissue around it, and it ended up helping him better. 
And I was think, and I think I also learned from the Grashton techniques that I was um, learning from Ms. Borish that once you find like the hurt area, you uh, you kind of work around that too to help the the tissues. So it's like it's not just the point; you have to help the tissues around it as well. So that was a, a hard thing. It was a new thing, hard thing to learn, and but it's helped me and it's helped my my other friends too since then. Yeah, I, I, I'm right there with you. My, my thought is, you can stretch tissue. We all know we can stretch tissue, right? But I can only stretch a small amount of tissue a certain distance before it tears or is damaged. And since I can only get like a millimeter of improvement out of this little area of tissue, why don't I get a millimeter of improvement around a whole tr chain of tissue, and then I've got an inch of improvement. And that's enough to free up the area. And that's why I like to kind of branch out. Mr. Overman. So what I started doing, I use that uh, <clears throat> that move you taught us a while back, where you start at the neck, work up, and go real slow all the way down the back. And um, that's usually if I'm going to find a knot in that area, that's when I find it. But I finish my whole back massage, and then if I felt knot during that period, then I go back and work the knots for the last like two minutes or something. So I don't know. Do you think that's a good way? Because then they're getting the full thing plus the knots. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, my complaint about trigger points is when somebody doesn't do that work as well. Does that make sense? Okay, they just I, sit there. So what you're telling me is you kind of try to spread out, spread out all the fascia, and then you go back in for the areas where you're like, ah, there's still some work to be done here. Very different than just, you know, kind of doing trigger point work. So, yeah, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Miss Young. So, I kind of do the same thing. I'll, like, go down the back and when you find the little knots, like, I'll kind of cross fiber that area and just like until I find the knot and then work on it a little and then like keep continuing down until I find more. Yeah. And then I just do that like two or three times and then I just like leave it alone. Yeah. That's the other thing I had to learn is sometimes you just got to let stuff go. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just don't want us to be over focused on a singular point. And it doesn't sound like anybody here is. So we're going. Um, Uh, local twitch response is not something you're going to hear therapists talk about, by the way, but local twitch response is just you exciting a local nerve that causes then the muscle to twitch. That's that's what it is. It's, it's like a reflex. Um, I, I have actually only heard people talk about active trigger points, uh, which cause pain when you press on them. And somebody goes, oh, yeah, 